Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in today. We are going to be going back into Luke's Gospel, looking at chapter 8, verses 40 to 56, and finishing chapter 8 today. Um, really looking forward to spending some time in God's Word. Um, hopefully you enjoyed uh, the school holidays over the last couple of weeks. Uh, if you didn't get away, maybe you just uh, appreciated a little bit less school traffic in the mornings or in the afternoons. Um, but we are in the hall again, and so excited about that. Hopefully uh, you had a good time off. Why don't we uh, pray? We'll just jump into it. Father, thank you for this time you've given us. Help us, Lord, to really calm our heart, quiet our spirit, and to sit at your feet. And so, Lord, we lift this time up to you. We pray that you'll speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, we're going to be finishing up Luke chapter 8 today. But I want to begin with a question. How do you view interruptions in your day? Some people have such a tight diary that they don't have any room for interruptions. It's just not going to happen. They're not going to allow it. But then there are those things that are just out of our hands that we have no control over. You know, the boss hands you an unexpected project on top of everything else you're doing and you can't say no you have to do it or perhaps the MRI reveals something more sinister than what you expected a holiday can be overshadowed by lost luggage or stolen property an anticipated an anticipated move that was across town turned into five moves overseas you know, there's all these things that happen in our lives that we don't anticipate, didn't expect. But we mustn't forget that every detail of our lives, including the unexpected interruptions, are divinely orchestrated by God. And if God allows or injects interruptions into our lives, then he has a plan for it. There's a purpose behind it. To teach us something, to use us somehow, to glorify his name, to testify of his faithfulness, to save a lost soul, to build our faith, to cause us to trust him more and entrust our lives into his care. The unexpected is always a part of God's plan for our lives. We have to remember that, it's important. How did Jesus handle interruptions? When the unexpected happened to him, how did he handle those things? Now, we might say, well, he's God. There was nothing unexpected. That's true. Nevertheless, he was a man, and there were things that interrupted his day that weren't on the itinerary, at least from a humanly perspective. But how did he handle those things? That's what we're going to see in this, in this section. Now, let me briefly recap. Jesus was essentially rejected by the Gentiles in Garasa or Gadara, however you want to uh, go with, depending on your Bible translation. You know, it was the demon-possessed guys of the Gerasenes or the Gadarenes. They were on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and they've returned now. The disciples and Jesus left because the people of that region didn't want them around. They were perhaps a bit freaked out by Jesus uh, healing this, these guys and, and casting the demons into the pigs. We don't know, but at any rate, they they left and they returned now to a welcoming crowd who'd been waiting for him, which is likely in Capernaum. And amidst the pressing mob, Luke here combines two narratives into one to show us how the Lord handled the demands of needy people and how he dealt with unexpected interruptions. There's a prominent young maiden and an ailing social outcast. Both are desperately in need. That's what we see here. One more acutely than the other, but both desperate. How did Jesus prioritize? How did he handle this situation? Now, that's more of a point of application that we'll come to a little bit later on. But what was Luke saying here? What's the bigger picture that he's revealing? What really was his message to his readers at that time? Well, I think Luke is wanting us to take note of Jesus' authority over sickness and death to validate and to establish faith in Christ and to show us how Jesus was preparing the apostles for what was coming because they were about to be dispatched with the gospel and they needed to know Jesus could be relied upon 
And they needed to know also how he handled the unexpected. Because the thing is, whether storms or natural catastrophes, forces of darkness or spiritual warfare, sickness, death, disease, all of these things, none of these things can close a door that God has opened, nor prevent God's will from being fulfilled. Jesus has authority in heaven and on earth, and nothing can prevent him from accomplishing the will of God. That's really important, because whatever God has called you to, he will fulfill his will. Now, as we cover this final passage of chapter 8, we conclude Luke's, Luke's treatment of Jesus' sovereignty and authority over nature, over the spirit realm, over sickness and death. And then as we enter into chapter 9, Jesus sends out the 12 on a preaching tour of their own. He'll send them out, and we'll see that next time. Which, in a way, shows us how Jesus had been preparing his disciples for the ministries that he would entrust to them. Not only has he been teaching people the value of having faith in him, not only have people been observing what faith is all about, he's been preparing the apostles for the work that lies ahead. See, ministry is not about developing methods or strategies. It's not about charm, talent, or charisma. It's about intimacy with Jesus, obedience to God's word, and reliance on the Holy Spirit. And so it was imperative they knew this. If they were going to be fruitful in establishing the church, laying the foundation of the church of the new covenant, if they were going to be fruitful and effective, they needed to understand the importance of intimacy with Christ, obedience to God's word, and a reliance upon the Holy Spirit. And that's what they were discovering here in this chapter and all the time that they spent with Jesus. Now, interestingly, all three synoptic gospels tell us these intertwined narratives the same way. Jesus returned from the Gerasenes. He was met by Jairus about his daughter who was in need. They're interrupted by an anonymous woman, and then they go to Jairus' house. Now, Jairus, his daughter was 12 years old, and this anonymous woman had been suffering a chronic illness for 12 years as well. Her illness she'd been dealing with for the entire life of this little girl. But the past 12 years had been very different for these families, very, very different. One has been, you know, ambitious, growing, the joy, the blessings, the beauties of a child growing up. The other has been plagued by infirmity and useless doctors who weren't able to treat or help her. But when their lives intersected with Christ, because they had faith in Christ, they found healing and joy. Now, let's meet Jairus, excuse me, Jairus, and we'll set the scene. Look at verses 40 to 42. Now, when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. Now, if you compare the different accounts of this story, Matthew puts the entry of Jairus in his request of Jesus at the point when Jesus was sharing a parable about the new wine being poured into new wineskins. And you recall the story there. We looked at it several weeks ago. Um, Jesus was making the point that I'm introducing something new. It's a new covenant. You can't force it into the old wineskins of Judaism. It doesn't work. It will never work. You need to put this into the new wineskins. And he had been teaching that parable. But then it says in Matthew 9, 18, while he was saying these things, as he was teaching, behold, a ruler came and knelt before him, saying, Jesus, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Now, from Matthew's account, 
Jesus was teaching. He was sharing this parable and he was interrupted by Jairus. But both Mark and Luke put the story upon Jesus' return from Gerasa. As if to say, and it's, you sort of read it this way, even though it doesn't actually say it like this, but this is how we kind of read it. As soon as they got back, Jesus was met by Jairus. Now, I wrestled with this. I, I looked at about 20 commentaries, and I'm not exaggerating. I looked at many, many commentaries, and no one addressed this issue. Here's what I think, and here's how I think this all fits together. Jesus had come back from the delivering the demon-possessed guys. He crossed the sea, and when he got back, according to Matthew's account, Matthew 9, verses 1 to 8, he healed a paralyzed man, and then he called Levi, who was Matthew, the tax collector, and had, had lunch at his place, or had a meal, we assume as lunch. It was there in that place, he had this bit of a verbal scuffle with the Pharisees in verses 9 to 13, and then afterwards, it, he didn't have to be sitting there, he could have just as well got up, he may have been somewhere else, and perhaps he was by the sea. It was then that Jesus was questioned by John's disciples, John the Baptist, and they questioned him about fasting. Why did John's disciples, why are we and the Pharisees fasting, but your guys aren't? To which Jesus replied with the parable of the wineskins. And while he was saying these things, Jairus rocked up in desperation. Please come to my daughter, he said. She's dying. Now, in Matthew's account, Matthew records that he said she was dead because Matthew gave the abbreviated version of the whole story. If you read the accounts and you compare them, you'll notice how there's not a lot of detail in Matthew's account. He gave the abbreviated version of the story. Mark and Luke correctly state that she was dying and did die, but Matthew left out the details and said, well, she's dead because she was going to die. So why did Matthew, or excuse me, Mark and Luke not include these other stories in the same chronological order as Matthew? Well, we can only speculate, but I think they inserted them in their points of the gospel that they had, had written to emphasize the certain themes that they wanted to convey. Remember, they were writing to different audiences and they were wanting to portray Jesus in different ways. And so they took these stories that are in Matthew's account, they inserted them into their gospels in different points to emphasize different themes. That's what I think took place here. Suffice it to say, since the stories of the ruler's daughter and this anonymous lady are about exercising faith and relying on God, then they follow well Matthew's version of the story, don't they? Because Pouring new wine into new wineskins is about life in the new covenant. It's about living and walking by faith and trusting and relying upon the Spirit of God. And that's the lesson Jesus was teaching these people. In fact, the crowds and his disciples, everybody who was there, he was speaking about the value of faith in Christ. And having faith in Christ results in walking in the Spirit and relying upon the Spirit. At any rate, the crowd was waiting for Jesus. They welcomed him when he arrived. And from out of the crowd, it says a prominent man of the community, who was a ruler of the synagogue, a man named Jairus, approached Jesus. He fell at his feet and implored him to come to his house because his only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. Now, a ruler of the synagogue was a well-known, prominent member of the community. He was responsible for the upkeep of the synagogue, the maintenance and all that took place there, as well as scheduling speakers, visiting preachers who would come into town, arranging worship services, and even community events. He was a, a central, prominent figure of the community. He was usually wealthy and a part of the elite upper class. Now his daughter, being 12 years of age, had come of age, meaning she would have likely been a hot prospect for young suitors seeking a wife because 
her dad would give a pretty fancy dowry to, to hand her over in marriage. But Jairus was a part of the religious establishment that Jesus often butted heads with. And yet this guy, hearing the stories of Jesus, connecting the dots about the Messiah, relating to the Old Testament passages concerning the Messiah, how Jesus had connected those dots, he believed in him. He believed in the Lord and he humbly and publicly confessed his faith when he fell down before Jesus in the midst of this crowd and begged him to come to his house. See, his little girl, the apple of his eye, filled his heart with warmth, with joy, with blessing. She was everything to him. She was his only daughter. And she was precious and she was special. I remember one time pushing um, Milena when she was a baby in the pram, stroller, and this old man stopped me and he said, son, I have sons and I have daughters. And he said, sons make you a father, but daughters make you a daddy. And I thought, wow. And I understood what he meant having daughters. Your heart just melts. And, and no doubt, Jairus' heart was melting for his daughter. That was the apple of his eye. She was everything to him. And the doctor no doubt told him, there's nothing more we can do. You better set things in order. You better get things all sorted out because she's not going to make it. But that wasn't good enough for him. So he sought out Jesus. He implored him. He begged. He sought him. He surrendered. Help me, Jesus. And Jesus, notice, he immediately went with him. Now, the crowd was massive. It had grown People were pushing and squeezing in, almost crushing each other. That's what the language tells us here. It was so intense. They were just pushing in like it was sardines. Jesus, his disciples, Jairus, as they're making their way through the crowd, going to Jairus' house, the team was interrupted by another needy soul. Notice verse 43, what it says. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. So Luke gives us a background of who this woman is. Now she will explain her story in just a minute, and that's why Luke tells us ahead of time what was going on with her. Verse 44, she came up behind Jesus and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? And when all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, someone touched me for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, when Jesus stopped to question who had touched him, amidst this crushing mob, the, the, the tension, the, the hurriedness of Jairus especially, the fact that they're en route to his house, going to fix and heal his daughter. When he stopped and said, who touched me? What was he thinking? What did he think? Is he serious? Who touched him? Come on, let's go. There's no time to waste. What are you doing? My daughter's dying. Let's go. Everybody's touching you. Who didn't touch you? The disciples and Peter perhaps were annoyed or maybe they were confused. Okay, Jesus just asked a pretty random question. It's obvious everyone's touching him. That's why Peter said, Master, who hasn't touched you? 
what are you talking about? And that's my paraphrase, but that's what he's saying. Who hasn't touched? Everybody's touching you. So they're either thinking, what's wrong with him? Or, okay, <laughs> let's gear up. There's a teaching lesson we're about to learn here. At any rate, Jesus persisted. Someone touched me, for power has flowed from me to them. And after everyone denied it, they're all looking around at each other. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. The woman whom Jesus knew, Jesus knew who touched him. He wasn't surprised. But the woman realized that she'd been exposed. And she stood there guilty before the Lord. And in fear, she fell down before the Lord and explained her situation and confessed her faith. Now, she had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. Unlike a normal menstrual cycle, she had a problem, and she was trying to fix it. And with what little money she had, she spent on doctors and medical treatment. She tried everything, and nothing helped. In fact, she only got worse. Now, her medical condition was one thing. But according to Jewish law, Leviticus 15, verses 19 to 30, she was considered unclean and therefore untouchable. She was unclean, ceremonially unclean. If she was married, she was either separated from her husband because he couldn't go near her, she couldn't go near him, or more likely they were divorced. For 12 years, she touched no one and no one touched her. And she was prevented from attending any religious or social gatherings. She couldn't go to the annual festivals or all the feast days of the Jewish people. She couldn't go to any of the birthdays or the weddings or the celebrations or the births or funerals, none of that. She wasn't allowed to go to any of those things. She was an outcast of society. In fact, entering this crowd as she did and touching these people as she no doubt did, that was against Jewish law. Everyone who touched her became unclean. That's why she was afraid when she was exposed. And people would have been backing away from her as she's explaining her, her story. Oh no, what is she saying? I just rubbed up against her. No, no, and they're freaking out. That's why she went for the fringe of Jesus' robe, so as not to touch him and not to make him unclean. She knew she couldn't touch Jesus. She wasn't allowed to. It was forbidden. But she believed that she could at least brush the tassel hanging from his robe. That's what the fringe was a little tassel. Those tassels in Deuteronomy are told were to hang from the fringe of the garment as a reminder of the laws of God, as a reminder to obey the laws. And Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. So she touched the little tassel that was hanging from his robe. And she believed if I could just touch that piece, that I'll be made well. He will heal me. Now there's nothing magical in Jesus' clothes. That's why he clarified your faith has made you well. It's because you trusted in me. It's because you believed I could help you. That's why you've been healed. It was your faith in me. Now, even though Jesus inquired about her, as I said, he knew who touched him. He knew, so why did he do that? Why did he call her out? Well, he's calling out her faith so he could call attention to her faith. The crowd, the disciples, Jairus, everyone who was there saw and heard that her faith in Christ is what healed her and saved her and made her whole. They witnessed Jesus' authority over sickness when God touched and healed her. Now the truth is, she would never have made Jesus unclean. She couldn't. Because anything unclean that ever touched the Lord became clean. Jesus cleans the unclean. In him is light. There's no darkness at all. He is pure light and cannot be darkened. But he can turn 
darkness to light. He can turn sinful into holy. He can make the unclean into clean and righteous. For her, 12 years of rejection, isolation, emotional agony, and the trauma that came with all of that, it had come to an end, and it was replaced with acceptance, with joy, with celebration, with cleanliness and righteousness. Notice how Jesus referred to her in verse 48, daughter. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. She'd become a member of God's family, a precious daughter experiencing God's peace and God's power. Interesting. Jesus was en route to minister to another daughter, Jairus' daughter, the daughter of a prominent community figure, a prominent young girl. He was en route to minister to the prominent of society when this poor woman interrupted their convoy and Jesus paused for the social outcast and he called her daughter. She is mine. She belongs to me. She's my daughter. See, in calling her daughter, I think he's building a bridge to Jairus' faith. If he can heal his daughter, that girl, then he can heal my daughter. So when news came that his daughter had died, Jesus said, remember, we'll look at it in a second. Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe, and she'll be made well. He's laying the groundwork for Jairus' faith. Now, he already has faith because he came to Jesus. But he's about to hear the most horrible news a father can hear. Your daughter is gone. And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Just believe. Trust me. You've seen what I've done with this woman, my daughter. You can trust me with your daughter. Look at verse 49. While he was still speaking, so Jesus once again is interrupted. While he's speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus on hearing this answered him, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Jesus, excuse me, except Peter and John and James and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called saying, child, arise. And her spirit returned and she got up at once, and he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Now, most people believe that a sick person who is living always has a chance to, to be helped. While a person is sick and living, there is a chance for them to be helped and to healed. But once they're dead, it's over. So when the young girl died, Jairus was instructed by those who'd come from his house, hey, don't bother the teacher anymore, it's too late. It was over as far as they, could, they were concerned. But Jesus has authority over sickness and death. So he said, don't fear, only believe, she will be well. Trust me, it's going to be okay, is really what he's saying. Don't worry about it. Now, when they arrived at the house, the professional mourners were already there making a fuss. Matthew 9, verse 23 says the flute players were there playing a dirge. They were playing funeral music. Everyone knew the girl was dying. 
So the musicians, the singers, the wailers, they're all on standby. And as soon as she breathed her last, they erupted in their customary morning commotion. People are screaming and crying. The music starts playing to indicate that this person who was alive is now dead. But these were professionals. Many may have not even have known Jairus. Perhaps they knew of him, but they didn't know him, much less his daughter. They were simply hired to be there to you know, follow the customs of the day. The customs of the day, the more mourners you had at your death indicated the more popular and well-loved you were. At any rate, that's what's going on here. So when Jesus showed up, he said, what's all this fuss? What's this commotion? What's going on? Don't cry. She's not dead. She's only sleeping. And the people laughed at Jesus. They thought he was off his head. Because they all knew she was dead. That's why they're carrying on. So Jesus called Peter, James, and John, the mother and father of the little girl, and they went into the house with him. The rest of the disciples stayed outside. The crowd stayed outside. And then he said, Child, arise. In Aramaic, Talitha Kumai, little girl, rise up. And it says, Luke says, her spirit returned. And the other accounts say she got up and began to walk. Jesus then told her parents to give her something to eat, which is a sign that she'd been healed. When people have an appetite, it usually means they're healthy and well. So they fed her, and the parents, it says, were amazed. And the word means absolutely blown away. They had no explanation. They couldn't contain the, the awesome miracle that had taken place. They, they couldn't explain it. They didn't understand it. They were utterly, completely blown away. That's what that means. And Jesus told them to keep it a secret. Don't tell anyone what had happened. But of course, everyone knew. He knew that when word got out about him raising the dead, that people would be coming to him from all walks of life with their issues and ailments more so than they already were. And so he wanted them to keep quiet until the time came for him to be publicly recognized when he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. So he told them to keep it a secret, but of course everyone knew. Now, what can we glean from this story? There's a few things that I think we can pull out of this that are helpful for us. First of all, God has no respecter of persons. He loves the lowly outcast just as much as the prominent elite. He paused to look after a poor anonymous woman while the leader of a community anxiously waited for him and for her. Secondly, Jesus wasn't frustrated or angry about these unexpected interruptions, but he seized the moment to heal one person, actually two, and teach people about faith. See, God injects and allows interruptions into our lives for his divine purposes, which include our spiritual growth, the saving of souls, the building of faith, all of these things and more. When we experience his faithfulness and provision, when we see God's power at work, things happen. Our faith is strengthened or established we grow spiritually because we know we can rely on the Lord more. And people acknowledge that God is real and genuine and that he can be trusted. And so God allows divine interruptions into our lives and sometimes he injects them into our lives for his plans and purposes. See, the next event in Luke's account is the commissioning of the 12 to go out on mission. He sends them out. And they needed to know God could be trusted, that God would move and work on their behalf. And these experiences would have strengthened their faith. God calms the storms and he casts out demons. He heals the sick and he raises the dead. If God be for us, who can be against us? See, 
when you see these things, it gives you confidence in your relationship with Christ, doesn't it? It should. Because if God be for us, who can be against us? If we belong to him and he is ours, what have we to fear? See, aside from the individual and the communal works of Christ, how he touched people's lives individually and personally, how he worked throughout communities, aside from all that, Jesus was preparing his disciples for God's work that would continue after his departure. He knew his ministry as a Jewish man walking the streets of Israel was only for a short time. Three years, a little more than three years. And he knew that he would pass the baton to his disciples to carry on his work. And so he's preparing them for that work. He's preparing them. And he's preparing us. He's preparing us today for the work he plans to do tomorrow. I want to share this quote from Frank W. Borham. It's in his book, Ships of Pearl. It's a great quote. I've, I've shared it before. Perhaps you've heard it. But listen to what he says. The church is his body. He had a body in his Galilean days, the body we associate with Bethlehem and Calvary, the body of the incarnation and the resurrection. But the body born of the Virgin Mary was a body that imposed upon him the most painful limitations. It was a Jewish body which exposed him to all the hates and prejudices in which the Jew was involved. The body he wore along the high roads of Judea forced upon him a national limitation. He rebelled against it. He loved to look away to the future and think of the kingdoms that were destined to be his. He delighted in winning to, to himself people of all races. But the hampering limitation was always there. His body was his prison, his cage, his dungeon, and he longed to break free. The church has given him his liberty. In the church, he has found a body that subjects him to no such narrow restraints. She is his international body. She belongs neither to East nor to West. She is not one color or race. The church is Christ's universal body, the body in which he can appear to any tribe or people in their own culture and language. The church is his deathless body. It is immortal and indestructible. The body that he wore in Jerusalem was crucified. A time came when it needed a tomb for its burial. But this new body, his church, has been burned, starved, tortured, thrown to wild beasts, and yet it lives on. By no death can it be slain, on no cross can it be crucified. We are the body of Christ, the universal body of Christ. He's our head, we're his members. Jesus, therefore, is constantly preparing us for tomorrow, using today's interruptions for the glories of God tomorrow. Never discount an interruption in your day. Count it, actually, a divine appointment. God has allowed this, or God has injected it for a reason. You may never know the reason, but he may show you the reason just the same. Because we are his church, and we are the members of his body, and we are the people through whom he functions to accomplish his purposes. That's radical. God doesn't need us, and yet he has plucked us out of the world and brought us into his fold and he has transformed our lives and made us something different and he anoints us to use us for his plans and purposes.
What a glorious privilege. What a wonder. What a beautiful thing. Rejoice in the fact that you belong to God, if indeed you do belong to him. If you don't, you can. Well, how do I belong to him? How do I become a member of his body? How do I become a child of God? You simply acknowledge that Jesus died and paid the price for your sins. And you confess your sins. And you ask God to forgive you. Lord, forgive me for everything I've ever done. Forgive me for the sinful lifestyle I've lived. I repent. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to know you and I want to walk with you. Would you come into my life to be my Lord and to be my Savior, to bring healing to my life spiritually that I might be whole? Lord God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Anoint me with your presence and your power that I might be a vessel that you could use for your divine purposes. If that's your prayer and you've prayed that before the Lord, then believe that Jesus has come in, that he's cleaned house, that he's set up house in you, and he will live with you for eternity and you will live for him for eternity. What a glorious privilege. What a wonderful savior. This one who loves us so and gave us life for us. Lord God, thank you for your goodness and grace. And thank you, Lord, for reaching into our lives and setting us free. We acknowledge your gift of salvation. We embrace it. Help us, God, to live in light of it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you desire prayer, or perhaps if you prayed and you have questions, you're not sure what it means to walk with Jesus, you don't know what a life with Christ is supposed to be like, well, get in touch with us. Contact us through the phone number or the email. Just reach out and we'd love to chat with you. God bless you. See you next time.